All right, guys, it is now 7.30 p.m. in Manila, and it is time to start our service. Lift your hands with me to the Lord. Father, right now, I love you. I always love you. I dedicate my life to you. Lord, we worship you. We come together to glorify your name. Lord, I pray that you would receive our worship. You would receive this sacrifice of praise. I pray that you would be blessed as we focus our attention on you. And Lord, I do pray in in the mighty name of Jesus, that as we come together in one voice from many, many living rooms, many, many bedrooms, many, many uh, houses, Lord, uh, even if people are, are commuting right now, wherever they are, Father, I just pray that as our voices lift up together, Lord, you would bind us together in unity, and Lord, you would bind us together as the body of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that as we worship, uh, our mindsets will change, our our attitudes will be transformed. I pray that our hope would be strengthened, that our faith would arise in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for a release of healing right now to flow as we worship you, as we pray to you through song. In this name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody says, amen.
If you're tired and thirsty There is freedom
of these kinds of emotions, Father. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit to just move in, oh God. Father, just continue to move in, oh God, all the places, Lord God, wherever they've been. And Father, I pray that uh, whatever their circumstances right now, Father, I pray that be free any kinds of emotional problems, Father. Be free, Father, in the name of Jesus. Those kinds of fears, those kinds of emotions, Father. But I pray, Father, that uh, they will freely seek you, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the gift of life and for all the blessings that you have blessed us with. Lord, all our lives you have been faithful and good. You have been loving and caring, forgiving and protecting to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. We are forever grateful. Lord, we thank you for answering our prayers. Thank you for saving the lives of Sister Sharina and Brother Noah. We pray for their complete healing and speedy recovery. Lord, we, we thank you for the lives of Mami Shelmon, of Brother Levy, of, of Sister Petchi, and Baby Adriel. Lord, we pray for the grieving family. Give them comfort, give them joy and peace, Lord God, knowing that their loved ones are already in your presence. Lord, we pray for the Jumai Church, for all the pastors and the members, Lord God, and for our families, Lord God, and relatives, Lord God, to continue to bless us, O Lord God, and provide our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray for each and everyone who are watching right now, Lord God, that you give us a heart, Lord God, to meditate on your word and to obey all your commands. Help us, O Lord God, to be faithful and to endure till the end, O Lord God. Lord, may this, this help us, O Lord God, that in these trying times, we will be more personal and more intimate in our relationship to you, Lord God. Lord God, that in, our, that in the end, Lord God, it is... Only you, O oh Lord God, it is about our salvation and our desire to save our families also, O oh Lord God. Lord, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord God, in our talk, in our thoughts, and in our heart, Lord God. Cleanse us, O oh Lord God. Purify us, O oh Lord God. Make us white as no one, pure as gold, O oh Lord God. Lord, we thank you for all your goodness, dear God. We will always sing all our lives. We will sing and declare your goodness to us, O Lord God. Church, before we end, before I end and say amen, I want you to please join me in declaration, in declaring that we, we sing together that I love you, Jesus, more than anything. I love you, Jesus, more than anyone. Okay? I love you, Jesus, more than anything. I love you, Jesus, more than anyone. And everybody say, Amen. God bless everyone. Guys, I love worshiping the Lord with you, but I also love sharing God's word with you and praying with you. And the Lord has given me a message for tonight uh, that has changed my life as I have researched it, as I've delved into it, and as I have studied it. And so I pray that this word will help you and this word will change you as well. My message title tonight is What Will Float Your Boat? What will float your boat? I think that you guys all know uh, that boats are designed to float so that when the waves and the winds and the waters rise, uh, we will not drown. And we want to be in a good boat that will float. And the Word of God really shows us a principle on that. But before we get to that part of my message... I do want to talk about responding to God's messages. I do want to talk about uh, responding to the warnings that God gives, responding to the reports that God gives in our lives, because it's really, really important how we respond to God. It's also important how we respond to situations in life. It's also important how we respond to, to how the enemy works in our life. Your response 
to whatever's going on around you, especially to believing in God, to believing in the promises of God, those responses determine your future. Those things determine your destiny. And they even determine your attitude right now. Because your attitude, it's a cliche, will determine your altitude. Can I get a good amen on that? Amen. All right, so we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. I'm going to put it on the screen here for you because this is a very, very important verse for you to understand. And I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic Version here tonight. And a lot of people don't use this one as their regular Bible because it's kind of wordy, uh, but it does give a very uh, deep meaning in the English language of what the original language would have said uh, if you were reading it more straight from the Hebrew or from the Aramaic or from the Greek, as the case may be. So Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 in the Amplified, it says here, Who has believed? And in parentheses, it says, trusted in. Because you don't believe something unless you trust in it. Relied upon. In other words, I'm relying on this thing to get me through. I'm relying on this thing to bring me what I need in my life. Uh, who has relied upon, who has clung to, okay? I, I like to think of clinging to something uh, kind of like if, if I'm out at sea, uh, if, 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 if I'm about to go under, if I'm out of strength, I can hardly have the strength to, to keep floating, to keep swimming. But I find, you know, a, a piece of wood or, or I find a, a life raft or a life preserver and I cling to that thing with all my might so that I will make it. And so hey, that, that's what it means to believe. You cling to and you will not let go, okay? So let me back it up. Verse 1, who has believed, trusted in, relied upon, and clung to our message of that which has been revealed to us. Now this is Isaiah speaking, but, but he uses this term, who has believed our message? Now, Isaiah pretty much operated alone. He may have had someone helping him write this, or somebody may have compiled his writings and put them together in a scroll or in a book, okay? But he was speaking as if it was several people who were receiving a message. And I often wonder, why was Isaiah speaking this way? And I believe that it's this. The Holy Spirit was speaking to him, and he knew that he was representing God. And so he was saying, who's going to believe us? God, who's going to believe God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God working in me? Who's going to believe our report? Even right now, guys, I'm speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and so I hope that you believe us. Not just me, not just the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit and I. I pray that you will take this word, you will take this message, you will take this revelation that is coming from us, although you're only hearing in the physical my voice, but I, I believe that you're hearing the spiritual voice, you're catching the spiritual voice of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you are hearing us, but not only that, other prophetic people, other spirit-led people, other people who are dreaming driven by the word of God, uh, we often are preaching the same things on the same Sunday or on the same Wednesday, and we never even talk to one another. It's amazing because a lot of times the worship team will bring forth songs that tie directly with the message, even though I, the pastor, did not ask them to do any particular song. We're usually in the spirit on the same page. It's a beautiful thing. It is an awesome thing. I believe that somewhere else in the world, someone is preaching this same message. And, he, and even if it's not with the exact same scripture, it's it's on the same line. It's on the same page, okay? So who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been disclosed or been revealed, okay? Now, what is the arm of the Lord? The arm of the Lord represents the strength of the Lord. The arm of the Lord represents the fact that when you pray and he answers your prayer, his arm came into your life and he did something for you or with you or through you for somebody else, okay? The arm of the Lord gets revealed to who? To the people who believe 
his message. The people who believe his report, some versions say, okay? Uh, the Amplified uses the term message, but some versions say who has believed our report, okay? So God gives a message. God gives a report. And those people who believe it, those are the people to whom God's arm is revealed. Those are the people to whom God's power intervenes in their situation, intervenes in their life. So I'm asking you this question tonight. Whose report are you going to believe? Why is it so important to believe the report of the Lord? And the answer, guys, is this. We are constantly receiving reports. We are constantly receiving information from other sources. Are you going to believe the report of the doctor? Hey, you know what? A lot of times doctor's reports are inaccurate. And a lot of times doctor's reports are accurate right now, but they're going to be changed in the near future as God intervenes. Hello. But if you believe that the doctor said that you only have a certain number of time to live, but God has told you otherwise, the doctor said you've got six months, but God says, I'm going to bring you to the age of 80. Okay. You've got to believe the report of the Lord. Now, if the doctor's report is in line with what God is doing, then the doctor's report is accurate. Okay. But we don't want to just believe the doctor's report. We want to believe the report of the Lord. We want to hear from God. And yes, someday it will be your time. Yes, someday it will be my time. And that's okay if that's what the Lord says. Are you with me? Okay, guys, when it's my time, I will go willingly. I will be promoted to heaven. Okay, I will go willingly, but I don't want to die before my time. I don't want to die before my mission on this earth is complete. And so until the time comes when God says to me, Steve, put your house in order because you're coming to join me really soon. I'm going to promote you really soon. So until that time happens, I'm not going to believe any other report. I'm not going to believe the report of the devil saying, I'm going to kill you. The devil has told me that so many times. Guess what? He's tried. He's given it his best shot. But I'm not going to die until God says that it's time for me to die. Amen. That's the way that I'm going to live my life. There's constant reports from Facebook. There's constant reports from YouTube. There's constant reports from Channel 7. Constant reports from Channel 5. Constant reports from the, from the different news bureaus and the different agencies and the different magazines. Even Hollywood is constantly giving reports. Guys, the enemy tries to saturate our minds, tries to saturate our situations with different reports that, that try to drag us into fear, that try to drag us into materialism, that try to drag us into confusion, that try to drag us off into distraction. Would you be surprised if I told you that more people are aware of what's going on in the lives of movie stars than they are aware of what's going on in the spiritual realm that God is doing? Why? Because they spend so much time listening to, studying, being obsessed with the reports of Hollywood versus the report of the Lord. And if you want God to move in your life, you need to believe the report of the Lord. Amen. Guys, here's something that I almost hesitated to tell you. But we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. And I'm going to testify to you right now that sometimes my own voice, usually my own voice in my own thoughts, sometimes my own voice is even worse than Satan's voice in my life. What do I mean by that? Guys, watch yourself talk. Watch the talk that you mutter under your breath. Watch the talk that you say out loud when you're by yourself. 
Watch out for that stuff because your tongue has the power of life and death. Watch out for that stuff. Guys, a lot of times when I, I hear the voice of the Lord, it's a still, small voice. A lot of times when I hear that voice saying, I'm going to bless you, I'm, I'm going to do this miracle, or I'm going to do that miracle, my voice immediately reacts and says, that's impossible. Sometimes when I'm needing a healing and I read a scripture about healing, my voice jumps up and says, yeah, God healed you in the past, but I don't know if he's really going to heal you this time. Maybe God wants you to suffer right now. Maybe God isn't going to intervene in your life this time. You know, and God's trying to speak to me through his word, but my own voice fights it. Why? Why am I such a skeptic in the natural? Because I'm human, and I know that you're a skeptic in the natural as well. Even those of you who are less skeptical and more optimistic than others, even you struggle with skepticism from time to time. That is our human voice. I have to choose to believe the report of the Lord rather than my own thought. Rather than my own reactions. Sometimes uh, regarding the blessings of the Lord, I'll think to myself, oh yes, God will do that for others. But I don't know if he's in the mood to do it for me. I don't know if he really wants to do it for me. Guys, my life has been filled with blessing upon blessing upon blessing. But sometimes I do exactly what the Word of God tells me not to do. And sometimes I compare my blessings to the blessings of other people. And sometimes I, I start to get dragged down with the spirit of comparison. You know, friends, you can take my blessings on a high day and compare them to somebody else's blessings on a low day, and it looks like I'm more blessed than they are. But you can compare me to that same person, and on a high day, high day they're, they're mightily blessed, and on a low day, I'm blessed, but not as high as them. And you might get the impression that over the course of a lifetime, they're more blessed than I am. Guys, that's not true. God blesses all of his children. God blesses you. God blesses me. But there are seasons that God brings us through. There are timings that God brings us through. Can I get a good amen on that? Guys, sometimes regarding temptation, temptations come into our lives. Sometimes our, our own thoughts come and, and we start to think to ourselves, well, you know, the last time I didn't really suffer many consequences from that. It's not really going to affect me that much. I, I mean, sometimes... You know, the, the voice of the serpent, like what came to Eve, okay, is very strong in our lives. But sometimes it's not even the voice of the serpent. It's just your own voice. Oh, God will still bless. God will still bless. Here's, here's a big one. This is one that I have often told myself in the past. I've often told myself, his grace is sufficient for me. Now that sounds very spiritual. You know why? Because that's scripture. But there have been times when my flesh tries to take that scripture and use it out of context as an excuse to give in to temptation. That scripture was never meant to be an excuse to give in to temptation. Yes, when I'm weak, he is strong. Yes, his grace is sufficient for me. But I have to decide to overcome that dumb, stupid voice that comes from my flesh and believe the report of the Lord. And I have to overcome that idiotic voice of the media. I have to overcome that really strong and mesmerizing voice of Hollywood. I've got to overcome it, and I've got to believe the report of the Lord. Guys, Romans chapter 3, verse 4 says this, and this is the part B of the verse. It says, let God be found true, though every human being 
is false and a liar. Let God be found true in your life, even when every human being, including ourselves, my heart is deceitful above things and beyond cure, is what the Word of God says. Even when my own heart lies, even when my own mind lies, even when my own emotions lie, God is always found true. Let God be found true in my life. And every voice of human reasoning, every voice of human wisdom, let every voice, let every human being be known to be, be found to be false and a liar. Guys, why else do you need to listen to the report of the Lord? Because Matthew twenty-two fourteen 14 is where Jesus said, many are called. Called also means invited. Many are invited. Many are summoned. I'm summoning you to the call. I'm inviting you to the call. Many are called, invited, and summoned. But few are chosen. Who gets chosen? Whoever is faithful. Who gets chosen? He who responds to the report of the Lord. Who gets chosen? He who responds to the messages of the Lord and learns to reject those messages, those reports that come from the flesh and from the world. Those are the people who get chosen, not just called. Amen, guys? That's such a, such a powerful statement. It's such a powerful verse. And I believe Gateway Mission Assembly and all of our friends who are joining us live, I believe that you are called. And I believe that this is a season of choosing. This is a, a season of you choosing to believe the report of the Lord. And it's a season of the Lord responding to your choice of choosing to hear his report and him choosing you to use you mightily as a mighty warrior in his mighty army for this mighty end time generation. Wow. All right, guys, I think that you figured out how you float your boat. One of the ways that you make your boat float is to believe the report of the Lord. But right now, I do want to bring you to Genesis chapter 6. You knew that we were going to be talking about Noah's Ark, right? Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. And I am not going to read the entire story to you. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that I think are really, really important, okay? And so let's go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And it says here, this is when God has already been telling uh, Noah what he's going to do with the earth and how judgment is going to come. God has already been telling him, I've had enough of this evil. I've had enough of this violence. Okay. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to flood the earth and you are going to need to build for yourself an ark. Okay. For yourself and for who? For your family and for all of the animals. And it's really for me, but you're going to build it for yourself. In other words, God was saying, I'm not going to build it for you. You're going to build for yourself an ark. And it says in verse 9, this is the history of the generations of Noah. I love how it says that. Did, did you guys know that we're all from Adam? But did you also know that we're all from Noah? Did you know that? Because God started all over again. And so our father, okay, our father is Adam, but our father is also Noah. Okay, we all come from Noah. We're all descendants of the survivors of the great flood. And this is our story, just as much as it is anybody else's story. This is the history of the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and righteous man, blameless in his evil generation. And I want you to catch this part. Noah walked in habitual fellowship with God. Noah walked in habitual fellowship with God. Now this is important, and I'm reading this to you again from the Amplified. Some, most, most versions just say Noah walked with God. 
okay? But there's different ways that you can walk with God, okay? The way that is described here, if you go to the original language, it is best known that he walked with God in a habit of fellowship, more like friendship, okay? There were not that many friends of God in the Old Testament, but I believe that Noah was. He walked in habitual fellowship with God. And guys, that is a big key if you want to go places with God, if you want to do big things for God. You need to walk in a habit of fellowship with the Lord. You need to walk in a habit of worship with the Lord. You need to be talking to the Lord several times per day. Can I get a good amen on that? All right. Habitual fellowship with God. And we're going to pick it up in verse 14. Make for yourself. Make for yourself. This is for you and for your family. And you're going to see who else it all is for. An ark. An ark is a massive boat. Kind of, kind of like an aircraft carrier. Okay. Make for yourself an ark of gopher or cypress wood. Okay. And make in it rooms, including stalls and pens and, and coops and nests and cages and compartments, okay? And cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the way trees grow, you know that there's this gooey, sticky substance in the trees uh, called pitch. Some, some trees even have rubber coming out from them, okay? Uh, it's that stuff that if you get it on your hands, even you wash with water, it doesn't come off, okay? Sometimes it takes a couple days for that pitch to come off of your hands. It's very, very strong, very, very sticky, okay? Uh, there, there's a lot of different fruits that even have that oozing out of their stems, okay? The part that, that you separated from the tree. And so God was telling him, build this ark, put all these rooms, all these stalls, all these spaces, in this ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. In parentheses, it says here, bitumen, okay? Now, bitumen is something that we have in the world today, and it's one of the key ingredients in asphalt. That's why some of the translations don't use the word pitch, they use the word tar. Tar is a black substance uh, that is often used to build the black top on the roads. Now, in the Philippines, it's almost all asphalt. Uh, but in America, there's, there, there's more black, um, black covering uh, on the roads, okay? And there's bitumen in that. And so what God was telling Noah to use was a very strong substance, okay, that you probably got from the sap of trees or, or other sources that we may not even know what the sources were, but God told him, it's not enough for you to just use the gopher wood or the cypress wood. You need to go and get this very sticky, very strong substance and cover the ark on the inside and on the outside. Now, I have to tell you guys, okay, um, I don't mind working with wood. All right, I, I don't mind, I, I enjoy it. I don't mind cutting it, I don't mind nailing it, I don't mind putting pegs in it, I don't mind putting, putting it together, I don't mind sanding it. But what I really don't like is dealing with sticky stuff. As a matter of fact, I was doing this just the other day. It has nothing to do with this message, okay? But I was staining with oil stain uh, some panels that I was going to put on the wall of my house and I was going to attach uh, the, the TV mount to the wall so that it's not sitting on a, on a table, but so that it's uh, coming out from the wall. Most of you have probably seen something like that in a hospital room where, the, where the, the TV in the hospital room is mounted on a wall. Well, I have that in, in my bedroom. And the only way that I could do it was if I put some wooden panels there uh, that, that connected to the wood structures behind the wall so that they would be really, really strong. Okay, so I used oil stain on the wood to make it a really nice color. And let me tell you what, that was sticky stuff. 
I really didn't like working with it. It got all over my hands. It got under my nails. It got into my cuticles, okay? It got everywhere, and it even messed up, uh, you know, some of the concrete outside uh, where I was working with it. I had to clean it up pretty rigorously, okay? And I had to clean my hands very rigorously, and, and I had to wait for this stuff to dry before I used the wood and, and attached the wood to my wall. What I'm saying is that I like the woodwork, but I don't like the sticky work, okay? I don't like working with that stuff that messes up my hands and is quite difficult to work with. I really don't like it. I believe that building the ark was the easy part. The woodwork was the easy part, but applying the pitch was a sticky mess, it was probably pretty hard to work with that sticky stuff and to keep it moist as you're spreading it on, um, hoping that it's not going to dry too fast. And then when it's time for it to dry, making sure that it's getting hit with sunlight so it dries pretty quickly, okay? Uh, it was probably pretty hard to put it on the outside. It was probably even harder to put it on the inside. And you know what, guys? You wouldn't be able to put it on the inside and then step on it. You'd have to have planks over the pitch. You'd have to have planks over the bitumen. All right? So this probably was not very easy for them to work with, which is an amazing thing. So, so I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in a minute. But I want you guys uh, to know that in, in my opinion, okay, and I believe that it's accurate, that boat would not have survived the flood if it had just been wood. That boat would not have survived the storms unless there had been pitch or tar or bitumen or a very sticky, very strong substance sealing up on the outside and on the inside every crack and crevice. God said, don't just fill in the cracks, cover it. Fill in the cracks and cover it. Cover that ark with pitch. Cover the inside and the outside of that ark with pitch. You know, guys, we have often taught about sealing our lives against the attack of the enemy. Usually we will say, don't leave any door open to the enemy. Don't leave a foothold for the enemy. Uh, that, that is a place in the wall where he can, he can put his foot and climb over the wall of your life. Don't even leave a window open for the enemy. Guys, Noah took it a step further. All right? Noah took it a step further. And God told him, it's not enough to just not leave an open door. It's not enough to just not leave an open window. You've got to literally seal every crack in your life against the flood of the enemy, against the attack of the enemy. Guys, we are living in an unprecedented time. In other words, it has never been like this before. And I don't want to be a doom and gloom person. I don't want to be a doomsayer. But I want you to understand that God has spoken to me in recent days, and he has told me that nobody living, and nobody who has ever talked to anybody who has previously been alive, I'm talking two or three generations, nobody in any recent history has ever gone through what we are about to go through. Guys, spiritual darkness is coming. Financial difficulty is coming. Disease and poverty and all kinds of trials and tribulations are coming, which the world has not expected and at a level that the world has not known in a hundred years, or maybe even longer. And God is saying to his church, I will 
protect you. Not only will I protect you, but I will use you. But you must build for yourself an ark if you are to make it through this season. Guys, many years ago, there was a young man, very prophetic. And we were in the middle of a prayer meeting. It was in Quezon City. It was in New Manila. And he, as we were ending the prayer meeting, he had a vision from the Lord. And he said to me, Pastor Steve, I see snakes coming into your house. He said, and all the doors are sealed and all of the windows are sealed. But the snakes are coming through the drain in the shower. He said, you've got to seal the drain even because the snakes are coming into your house. Let me tell you what, guys, that prophetic word saved our family. God used that to alert us as to what was going on at that time in our lives. And we were able to rout the attack of the enemy because of that very powerful, profound, and timely prophetic word. But I want you to know what's really sad about that. And that is that that young man who was so prophetic and so profoundly used by God, he allowed the snakes to come into his life and he no longer serves the Lord. As a matter of fact, he has gone on to a lifestyle sexually that is not pleasing to the Lord, and he has rejected church. He still believes in God, but his sexual desires are more important to him than serving the Lord. And it's really sad, and we pray for him on a regular basis. But even though he was the, the voice that God used, he walked away from God. Why? Because the voice of the desires, the report of the pleasure that was available to him that this, this life offers was stronger to him than the report of the Lord. What does that mean? That means I can be used by God, but later on, if I stop listening to his report, if I stop pursuing his report, I can fall away from the Lord just as that young man has at this point fallen away from the Lord, but we still believe that God has a plan and God can reach him. Guys, a time is coming. I believe it's actually already here for many people. That many Christians will follow social values. They will be more interested in social issues than they are in what is really important to the Lord. There are Christians that politics will be so important to them. Whoever it is that they value as a candidate, those people will be so important to them that they will not follow the word of God. I believe that in many lives we are already there. You know, guys, the Bible says that there is going to be a great falling away where even the elect, those who have been chosen by God, even the elect will walk away from the Lord. Why? Because the report of the world will be more important to them than the report from heaven, than the report of the Lord. So what is this pitch? What is this bitumen? What is this tar? What is it? <clears throat> Guys, it's several things. It is the word of God. Knowing the word, valuing the word, getting the word inside of you, living by the word. That is the sticky stuff that will keep your boat floating. It is prayer. Guys, I believe that I'm not 
praying enough. I believe that the vast majority of people who are watching right here, right now, I believe that you're not praying enough. I believe that we need to get prayer, the pitch of prayer, the tar of prayer. I believe that we need to saturate the inside of our lives with it. Saturate the outside of our lives with it. Saturate our families with it. Saturate our businesses with it. Saturate our church, our churches with it. What else is it? It's the word and prayer. It's worship. There's oil that gets released in worship. There is pitch that gets released, that oozes out of worship. As we worship the Lord, our arks, our homes, our vessels, we get oiled and we get sealed for the glory of God and our boats float through the storms of life. What else? I'm just giving a partial list here tonight. Godly fellowship. Fellowship with godly men and women. Fellowship with the kind of people that are going to give you counsel. And that's another one. Counsel. Godly fellowship and counsel that will really give you the real information that comes from the report of the Lord and not from the report of, and here's the next one, human wisdom. Oh, guys, we need the pitch, we need the tar, we need the sticky substance of heavenly wisdom, heavenly revelation to saturate and to cover our lives all for the glory of God. And guys, we need to learn how to avoid, avoid tailored temptations. The Lord spoke this to me today. He told me to tell you about this. He said, tell them to avoid, to learn how to avoid tailored temptations. What are tailored temptations? They're temptations that the enemy sends your way, designed specifically for you. Friend, you're about to be tempted. Right to the very edge of what you can bear. I'm about to be tempted right to the very edge of what I can bear. Guys, when we think of temptation, we often think it's sexual. Well, it might be sexual, but it might be something else as well. It could have to do with fear. It could have to do with your faith. It could have to do with social issues. It could have to do with politics. It could have to do with deciding to believe God's word no matter the consequence. There are consequences that this world will bring on those of us who believe God's word and will not budge. We will not be moved. And finally, the last one I'm going to mention right now is the pitch of unity. Unity, guys, it includes reconciliation. Unity is not just about getting in a circle and singing kumbaya together, okay? All right? Unity is not just about a few churches coming together and filling up a dome and singing some songs and listening to a message from a famous preacher. That's not all that unity is about. Unity includes reconciliation with people who have unforgiveness towards one another in their hearts. Boats without unity don't float. God says so in his word many different places, many different ways. We need forgiveness. We need to give it. We need to receive it. We need grace for one another. We not only need God's grace, but we need grace towards one another. We need to make effort. Deal with that yucky, sticky stuff. 
and bring wholeness and unity into your part of the body of Christ. My final verse, and I'm probably going to preach a little more about this on Sunday. It'll be a standalone message just like this one is, but we're going to keep going on this. My final verse tonight is Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. And it says here, why is this verse? It's hitting me. It's hitting me so strong. And they that entered the ark, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded Noah. He built for himself an ark. Remember, he's calling you to build for yourself an ark and to make it sticky, to seal, seal everything inside and out so that the waters will not penetrate, so that the, the attack will not penetrate. And the Lord shut him in. Some versions say, and the Lord closed the door. Some people don't even realize that Noah didn't close the door. Noah's kids did not close the door. God himself closed the door. The Lord shut him in and closed the door round about him. That's a supernatural closing of the door. Because the door was only in one spot. But the wording, the wording says that God closed the door round about him. I believe that when God closed that door, he used a supernatural force to close that door, which surrounded that whole ark like a force field. And the Bible says that as the waters rose, the ark rose above the mountains and the ground. It never hit anything, at least not very hard. That's a miracle. More than likely, as the waters rose, the ark would have been smashed against hills or mountains or rocks. The waters would have capsized it. The waters would have disintegrated that ark. But God closed the door. What does that mean, guys, to us? Honestly, I will never be able to float on my own strength. But God expects me to build my ark well. He expects me to build it big and to build it strong and to include as many people who he says in it. Gateway Mission Assembly and all of you who are watching that you consider me one of the voices in your life, maybe a, a spiritual father or a pastor at some level, hopefully you have more than one. I've invited you into my ark. As I am in the ark of some other great men of God. I've invited you into this ark, into this covering, into this vessel. And we are in this life, we are in this boat together. And it's going to float. Why? If we are faithful to apply the pitch, the bitumen, the tar, the sticky stuff to seal every crack and crevice. And if we will be faithful to do that, to keep the snakes out, God will seal us in. And 
we will not only survive this season, whatever it holds, it's going to be different for different people. It's even going to be different for different countries. Whatever this season holds, it is going to be a time that we, because we've been shut in by the Lord, we will thrive. Father, I see many exposed lives. I see open windows, I see open doors, and I see lives that are not sealed, gaping holes between the planks. Lord, we have not been faithful the way that we should be to worship and to pray. Oh God, to understand your word, to be students of your word, to be real disciples. Oh God, forgive us for leaving the openings, for being careless, for being sloppy. We have not operated in forgiveness. We have not operated in divine wisdom and divine revelation. We have not operated in unity. Oh God, I pray for every man, woman, and child who hears this, who hears my voice. I pray that you would direct us and lead us and guide us as to how to seal our lives, how to seal our arcs. And Lord, I believe it, just like you did it for Noah and his family, if we will be faithful to seal the enemy out, you, will shut us in. You will shut us in. You will shut us with the door all around us. I pray for grace. I pray for favor. I pray for protection. I pray a hedge of protection, a shield of protection. I pray, Lord, for all who are sick that you would heal right now. I pray for all who are desperate that you would comfort right now. I pray for all who are hurting that you would release your balm, your ointment into their lives right now. I pray that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would flow into every life right now. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for Brother Melvin and Sister Gail, Lord. Oh, God, I pray for Sister Jean, Lord. Gail and Jean have lost their mother. Oh, God, release your love. Release your comfort into their hearts, into their family right now, for all of the other family members. Oh, God, we thank you for her life, and we thank you that she is with you. Oh, God, we pray for the hostile family. Oh, God, we thank you for the life and the testimony of Brother Levy, but, Lord, you promoted him to be with yourself. We pray your peace, your healing, your protection, and your provision on that family, Sister Nancy and the kids, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I've noticed in my own life that many people have gone to be with you recently. Very seldom have I seen a season with so many funerals. Lord, I believe that it's because you are promoting. I believe that it really is because you are doing a mighty work and you are bringing many of your faithful servants home with you. And I believe that it does point to the fact that we are moving into a season with you that we need to be ready for. And so, Father, I just pray for a seriousness. I pray for a devotion. I pray for a dedication to come on to your people like never before. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I pray that you will study this word. I pray that you will go from here and you will figure out how to put the pitch, 
the tar, the sticky stuff into your life inside and out. Contact me. I pray. Contact me. I counsel. I give word-based advice. Contact any of our board members and pastors if, if you know how to get a hold of them or just contact me directly. We are here with you. We are in this boat together. And we need to make sure that we're prepared so that this boat will float. Let's worship. Let's pray. Let's get into God's word. And let's do all of the things that please the Lord so that this vessel will float as he shuts us in and protects us from the raging seas of life. I love you guys.